In the name of God, the holy and undivided Trinity. Amen. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins. That's been kind of my refrain through the week (laughs) as I have looked at these lessons and looked at that collect. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins. It's one of those prayers that might be hard to pray. I think we can get stuck on the bondage of our sins part, you know, and not move any farther forward. I'm stuck right there. Bondage of my sins. And it brings on this guilt and this shame when that's not the point of this prayer. <laughs> Set us free from the bondage of our sins and give to us the liberty of the abundant life that we find in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Life in Christ is freedom and it is abundance. And the implication to me of this prayer, this collect, is that we have indeed already been set free. We have already been released from our sins. We've been released from the fear of death. We've been released from the fear that holds us back, from everything that keeps us from living fully and freely and abundantly. In Christ, we've been set free, released. That's what Jesus does. I don't know how closely y'all pay attention to exactly how far we've made it into Mark's gospel since we began reading Mark's gospel on the first Sunday of Advent, but we're not even out of chapter one yet. And tons of things have happened in Mark's gospel. (laughs) I was saying in Sunday school this morning, in Mark's gospel, everything happens and immediately. And immediately Jesus did this, and immediately the disciples did this, and immediately, and immediately, and immediately. And it's this barrage of stuff. And that's okay. Today we find Jesus and Simon and Andrew and James and John leaving the synagogue in Capernaum and going into Simon's house. And they find Simon's mother-in-law sick with a fever, and they tell Jesus immediately. See, I told you. (laughs) At once they told Jesus about Simon's mother-in-law, and he heals her. And she got up and began to serve them had a friend in Birmingham of blessed memory who kind of turned that into probably an inappropriate joke. Um, Maybe just that much misogynist, and I don't want my repetition of that joke to be misinterpreted. But Lynn would say, you know, he only healed her so she'd get up and fix him something to eat. (laughs) But I don't think that's what's going on. (laughs) Jesus has been healing and casting out demons and commanding all right here in chapter one casting out demons and commanding the demons to remain silent. They know who he is, and he says, no, y'all hush. I don't want you telling the people this. It's not time yet. Besides, I don't want them to hear it from a demon. I want them to hear it from me. Ooh, that's probably it. This mark and secret is because Jesus doesn't want the demons telling it because he wants us to experience what? Liberty and abundance, just like we pray in that collect. Jesus wants us to experience firsthand the love, the grace, the beauty, the renewal, the healing, the wholeness. And that's what happens. I do think that what Jesus does for us is exactly what he did for Simon's mother-in-law. He heals us so that we can serve, so that we can do what we can to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. We have come face to face with the risen Christ. We have come face to face with the one who is healing us and who is renewing us, and that changes us. So, and immediately, we get up and we begin to serve. That is built into discipleship. We don't ask the question, what's in it for me? we slowly learn to ask the question, how can I share this? And with God's grace, maybe, just maybe, we become that much like the Apostle Paul 
That's probably about as much as we need to be like the Apostle Paul. (laughs) But I think we get suspicious sometimes when we hear Paul say, I became all things to all people. There's something about us that says, hey, wait a minute, this guy's not genuine. He's not authentic. He's willing to say or do anything just as long as he can win people to the gospel. And that's where we fall into the trap. That's exactly the point. (laughs) It's not that we become who we're not. It's not that we become any different than Jesus wants us to be. But what we begin to recognize, like I suspect Paul did, is that we have changed. We're on a new path. We are thinking differently. We are believing differently. We are walking through this world differently. And we don't forget that we've been where others are. It helps us to meet people where they are. Oh, yeah, I've had doubts before. Like, I, I, I have doubts today still. <laughs> can talk to people, interact with people in their doubt. I have done things I'm ashamed of, know what it's like to be ashamed. I can talk to people who are feeling that and say there's hope. There is renewal. There is the gift of new life in Christ. And so in a way, while we recognize, oh yeah, I'm not the same person I've always been. I have changed. My behaviors have changed. My attitude has changed. I see things and look at things differently in Christ than I did before. We've ended up right where we need to be. And we don't lose our experience. We don't lose those things, those lessons that we've learned. And it helps us to say, there's a place of renewal. Let's go. Let's gather together. Let's come to the table. Let's serve in the name of our Lord. Help us to do this. Set us free from the bondage of our sins. Oh, yeah, you already did that. Yay, you've already done it. And now we are going out, changed people, to proclaim this good news, to share this good news to all the people we can in all the ways that we can. And that is what changes the world. That is what sets us free from all those forces that holds us back. All those things that keep us from living fully into the kingdom of God. We've been released from those. Boom. Don't worry about them not one time more. I just realized this is going to be one of those sermons where I preach all three of the lessons. So my apologies. (laughs) I'm going to jump back to Isaiah because I think it tells us something that we need to hear. Isaiah, from chapters 40 to 54 or so, most scholars say that's second Isaiah. It's actually later in the first 39 chapters and was probably written during and after the exile in Babylon. And so what we hear are the exiles saying, wait, why isn't God hearing us? Why doesn't God see us? And God's saying, wait, have you not heard? Have you not seen? I'm right here. I have been right here this whole time. And Isaiah chapter 40 begins with the words, comfort, O oh, comfort my people. God breaks into our reality, reaches out God's hand to us and says, yep, I know, you don't have the strength that you think you need. You don't have the strength and the endurance that you think you need, but I am here to share it with you. When you wait upon the Lord, you renew your strength. Mount up with wings as the eagles. You will run and not be weary. I'm almost about to sing this. Walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, to wait. It's the way we sang it in Sunday school a long time ago. (laughs) Teach me to wait. Remind me 
that God is giving whatever we need. Whatever the community needs, God is there to give it. Strength, endurance, forgiveness, grace, love. We have indeed been set free. Amen.